Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Vagabond VC. I am in Rwanda before heading off to Nairobi to cover Kenya's ecosystem. But today's episode, we are still talking about Tanzania. Today, I'm thrilled to feature my guest, Salum Awad. Salum is the CEO of SSC Capital and also the founder of the Tanzania Venture Capital Network. We conducted this interview in his office in Dar es Salaam while I was traveling through the city. Salum is super involved in the local startup ecosystem and his insights have been really valuable. So I'm really excited to bring this episode to you today. So without any further delay, I bring you Salum Awad. So I am here in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania with Salum Awad. He is the CEO of SSE Capital. I think that's actually an understatement of all the things that you do here, but we're going to get into all of that. So let's go ahead and start with you, your background and how you actually got involved working with startups and venture capital. Sure. Thanks for having me. And I think it's a great opportunity to share what is happening in our ecosystem here. Yeah, so my name is Salum Awad. You can call it Salum as well. Depends on where you come from. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my background is in finance. I went to school here. And before I jumped into SSC Capital and everything that I do today, I was once employed. So I worked for USAID uh, with a project, which is under State University of New York. Uh, and then, of course, I moved to a pension fund where I worked for two years. And then I quit and started SSC Capital 11 years ago. So that's pretty much it. I'm born and, and, and raised here uh, in Tanzania. That's pretty much me, a father of two boys, and, and I'm happy to share that. Your involvement here with SEC Capital, how did you actually get focused more on the startup ecosystem and get involved? SEC Capital is a company. We, we are pretty much a strategy advisory and investment banking firm. So one of the things that we do, one of actually core things we do is capital raising. So we raise money for companies here and across the region. And our initial focus since we started was for companies that are raising anything from a million dollars. So you would see it by design that leaves out a lot of startups that are, that are raising money. So we could not assist the startups. We could not do anything for them then uh, because our focus was different. Uh, and then, of course, we saw the wave of many young people trying to employ themselves given the high level of unemployment here in many other African markets. Uh, and we saw that access to finance was one of the major challenges that they were facing. And because, of course, we have a background, I have interest myself, passion in finance, and I thought probably maybe there's something we can do for startups. So I think that was five years ago, I guess. That's when we started now to also see how can we support startups in terms of raising money. So our initial focus was pretty much around investor readiness uh, because we already had uh, some contact with private equity and venture capital funds that were looking for opportunities in this market. But we saw the huge gap between the supply and demand of deals. So our focus on startups and, and our involvement started there. Uh, initially just training and advising, doing some mentorship around, you know, how can you be investor ready? And that's how we also started Tanzania Angel Investors Network almost same, around the around same time to see whether we could address the gap that we saw. Because at that time, majority of all the private equity and venture capital funds which were coming down to Tanzania, which I think is pretty much uh, the same today, we are looking for ticket sizes for a million. Uh, and we, we thought probably we need to do a lot of work for smaller tickets, uh, save between 50K to 150K. Uh, and that's where our work for startups started. So that was the Tanzania Angel Investor Network. Yes. And it's, uh, yesterday when I was men- I mentioned to you, we were, uh, I was talking to Jumani and we were talking about access to capital. And I don't want to jump too much into the ecosystem here, right? Mm-hmm. Not just yet, at least. But since you brought it up with the Angel Investor Network, what is the status of an angel investor here? So, for example, where I come from in the U.S., there's some barriers to angel investment in terms of uh, having to be an accredited investor, things like that. So for someone to be an angel investor here, what are some of the parameters that someone needs to become an angel investor? Is it easy for someone to be an angel investor here? Are there, is there enough finance or in that basically that early stage area, what's what's going on with the angel investment piece? For Tanzania, we don't have like regulatory parameters uh, to define someone as an angel investor, uh, whether it's the level of sophistication or the level of investment they want to make or, you know, the amount of money they earn a year. That's a good thing, actually, it is, because it, it keeps... Is, yeah. 
Yeah, so for us, we define an angel investor as someone who can provide us with three things. One, has the ability to invest at least $5,000 per transaction. Secondly, someone who has a rich network uh, from his uh, own undertakings that can help the startup to grow. And thirdly, someone who can also provide some mentorship to this startup to learn from them uh, and grow. Because that's why we want someone to join us as an angel investor, the way we define them is whether you are successful in your own undertaking as an entrepreneur or you are a former executive, so you have held high-level position in the corporate world, so at least you know a few things, or Tanzanian living in diaspora who has accumulated some experience there that can be used here for startups to grow. So that's how we define uh, an angel investor here. I guess this is kind of a simple question, but... Are there a lot of them here in Tanzania? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. And that has been one of the major, major challenges. Actually, the main issue has been is not necessarily getting people with such qualities. I think the main challenge has been getting people potentially with such qualities, but with different mindset. Because majority of people who have such parameters, if it's successful entrepreneurs have made money in very traditional businesses, so they made money in, say, in manufacturing, or in, in transportation, uh, or in real estate. And they wouldn't look at startups as a potential asset class for them to invest in. And that's been the major, major challenge in the market. So you can get them there, but to move them from where they are to become investors for startups, that's, that has been the major challenge in the market. Because it's too risky for them, or they just don't understand the asset they class? Understand. They don't understand the startups as an asset class. They haven't seen, because, you know, startup ecosystem in Tanzania, just like it mean other African markets, still very nascent. So they want to hear a success story. So you go to talk to someone, they're like, okay, so give me three success stories. Startups that, are, you know, investors have exited the startups and such kind of stuff. So, yeah, that's where we are. Chicken or the egg, right? Yeah. So we need capital to make a success story, but we're not going to... Yeah. Fund you unless there is a success. Correct, story. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Going back a little bit to SSC Capital, you and I had spoken a little bit earlier about the, uh, and we were laughing about my Swahili, but the Mbadala yeah. Impact Fund, the MIF. So let's talk a little bit about that. You had mentioned to me that you had actually started this two years ago. Yeah. But you just started investing, I think, last month, right? So we plan to start investing last month. Well, let's talk through the background of it yeah. and kind of the plans yeah. for it. So as I said earlier, our role pretty much was around uh, uh, as, as a capital raiser, transaction advisor for companies, startups, and, and what have you. And then what you see is there are moments where the opportunity is very interesting, uh, but our partnering VCs cannot invest in because either the, the, the ticket size is too, too small for them to have, you know, commercial sense, or there's a huge uh, knowledge gap about that startup. So you come from the U.S., uh, maybe the way you want to look at a fintech here, you already have your legacy understanding about fintechs, maybe from U.S. or from Europe, or more advanced ecosystems, different from the way we look at. So you may pass that opportunity, but from my end, I feel like, you know what, this is a great opportunity, given my understanding of the local environment. So we leave out a lot of deals, you know, not only getting funded, just because the potential investor doesn't see that as an opportunity uh, to scale in the future. So that's where we say, you know what, maybe we need to have our own fund, uh, where we can fill that funding gap, one. Secondly, uh, because majority of all these investors coming down here are looking for, say, uh, Series A uh, type of investments. Uh, and these, these startups are not ready for Series A investment, Maybe we can invest in these startups and then probably whether they're pre-seed or at seed stage and then we can you know, move them to series A level where now they become a pipeline for potential VCs to take them up. So that's how we, we thought probably we can, we can do that and that's the reason why we named the fund Mbadala, which is Ohio for alternative, meaning that we provide an alternative way to finance these startups which they cannot easily be financed in the mainstream uh, venture capital ecosystem. Yeah, so it's a $5 million pre-seed fund, uh, set agonistic. So we invest in startups from a ticket size of 50 to 150K. And the plan, of course, we can do a few cases up to 300K, but they must have a strong impact business model around them and within the geography of East Africa. What was the process of fundraising like here in Tanzania? I don't know who your limited partners are, and if you, you don't have to disclose them per se, but the process of raising a fund located here in Tanzania, focus on Tanzania, what, what was that process like? What were some of the challenges there? 
No, you can, you can, you cannot raise a fund here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did it. <laughs> no, so the fund is not incorporated here. The fund okay. is incorporated in Dubai, oh, okay. uh, and uh, the fundraising is 80 percent done in Dubai as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we're only trying to bring a few high net worth individuals here to also come on board uh, as part of the LPs. And you mentioned you haven't yet started investing out of it, right? Yeah, the plan was yeah. last month. So is there a particular reason why there was a... Yeah, it's pretty much on our investors. So there's still some paperwork that needs to be finalized before we do anything, yeah. The interesting thing on that, and something I've been focused on recently, and also through my primary role at Seedstars, uh, you mentioned it's the MIF, the impact fund, right? Yeah. So what is the impact to you? How do you define impact? So for me, impact is anything that the business is doing intentionally to include the excluded and to uplift those who are probably living below uh, what I'd say profit line. Uh, so if your business model has a potential to do that. So for me, a startup, I would borrow this definition from one of the, from, from one of the colleagues. For me, a startup in, in Tanzania and in Africa should not really focus on disrupting but rather I should focus on including the excluded. And that's where we see the impact. So for me, impact is any undertaking that will change uh, the narratives and the lives of people in the com communities where we live in. Earlier, we were talking about the uh, Tanzania Angel Investor Network, yeah. right? Yeah. And you're also a lead for the Tanzania Venture Capital Network, yeah. right? Yeah. So how did the Tanzania Venture Capital Network come about? What's the history of that? What's some of the goals of, of yeah. that organization? Yeah, so when we started pushing for this venture capital agenda into the market, because before that, which of course is still the case, the majority of funding in this market is pretty much dominated by banks, commercial banks in particular, uh, which we all know are risk shy and real estate shy. So you cannot really rely on banks to unlock financing for startups and other small businesses in this market. That's why we thought probably private equity, venture capital, angel investing could be potential uh, you know, alternatives for, for funding for early stage businesses here. So what we did was to you know, start looking at, let's do the mapping first of all of venture capital ecosystem in Tanzania. So what are potential players who is interested to, to do investment in, in this market? What's the legal framework? You know, what's the, how's the culture? Uh, how is the readiness and all that kind of stuff? So we did that in 2018. Uh, and then we came to learn that the venture capital ecosystem in Tanzania was almost not there, not developed. So the Tanzania Venture Capital Network was started to do that, to develop the ecosystem. So it's, it's a not-for-profit initiative which seeks to build the venture capital ecosystem in Tanzania from policy, knowledge, events, data, you know, research, intelligence, everything that we think is necessary for the ecosystem to grow. What are some of the recent initiatives that you guys have been working on through the network? Yeah, so one is we are currently working with the Startup Association with the Minister of Finance to see how can we use government money as a source of funds to finance early stage VC funds locally here that can raise money locally here using government funds and start investing. Because for my case, as I said earlier, a $5 million fund is a very small fund. If you're trying to raise it internationally, it becomes very expensive. But guess what? We don't have any strong uh, local LPs uh, that can invest in your fund. But the government in Tanzania has an initiative where the structure of the government here is we have the central government of the local government. Uh, and so within the local government, the government enacted a law where 10% of all the revenue which is collected from the local government should be used to finance youth, women, and disabled. So it's part of enterprise financing. But the use of the fund is not, is not optimal. So we thought probably the government can take a portion of the chunk of the money and set up a government fund of funds that can be used to finance smaller funds like ourselves that we can start investing in, in early stage startups. So we are currently championing that, that initiative. Uh, so a few weeks ago, we had a stakeholders event where we brought in different players in the ecosystem to discuss about what we think and, and, and what sort of milestones we're trying to achieve. And today morning, as we speak here, we are also working closely with Startup, Tanzania Startup Association to support the government in their review of the Competition Act, which we think is one of the uh, disincentives for uh, private equity and venture capital investments coming to Tanzania. Now that's great, especially on that first point. I've seen that model with the fund of funds from a government back or sponsorship, so to speak, has been very successful in other places and has been a catalyst for venture capital investment in many other countries. I think 
the biggest example I know of off the top of my head is Corfo in Chile, which they basically were like an LP and these early stage funds and really kickstarted that startup ecosystem. So hopefully that's something that can definitely come about. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it has been successful in Ghana as well. Ghana. Okay. So let's move away from these specific activities and focus more on the ecosystem itself, right? And we've kind of touched on different areas just through some of the things we've already talked about. But I'd really like to know about when it comes to the ecosystem doing business here as a startup, investing here, what are some of the common misconceptions that there could be about doing business as a startup here in Tanzania? So I think from the startup perspective, first of all, I think there's a huge, huge underestimate of consumer literacy here in terms of picking up your solutions. People have tried solutions here, which probably would have worked well in other markets but they haven't in this market. So Jumia, which you may know, couldn't do anything here, so they had to exit the market. Uber has exited the market. Of course, there are other reasons for that as well. Uh, But one thing I can tell for a fact is uh, the orientation and the the mindset of a traditional consumer in Tanzania is pretty much different from other markets, say Kenya or South Africa or Nigeria. So there's a lot of work that a startup founder needs to think of uh, before you plan for this consumer the way we would have planned for a Nigerian or Kenyan consumer. So this is my perspective, number one, which I think is a major con- misconception that people have. Secondly, is building the calm. Uh, you think you can build a good solution, interesting app, uh, iOS, whatever, Android, and then people start using your app uh, and, and it's not working. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this idea of building the calm, uh, is tough to operate in this market as a startup founder. So you need to know that very well. And thirdly, from the startup perspective as well, is do not underestimate the obstacles that you face with government regulations. All the laws and regulations that we see in this market were pretty much created before this whole thing about startups and investments in this market. So none of them is startup friendly. Uh, so everything you want to do here, you should know that uh, somewhere down the road, say for instance in the fintech space, uh, you're going to face some obstacles. Some have, have tried here and they had to navigate to go to other markets to start and come back to Tanzania at a later stage. Yeah, But on the investor side, is, for me, I think uh, we, you may think Tanzania is the largest, second largest economy to Kenya, can give you almost the second option to what Kenya is offering. Unfortunately, that's not the case. As much as we're the second largest economy, but we still have a lot of work to do to be the second best when it comes to investment opportunities here as, a, as, a, as an investor, if you're looking to invest in opportunities here. But secondly, unlike some other people think that, you know, this, this cultural thing and historical thing that Tanzania was once a socialist com- country and probably it's not as open as Kenya, for instance, Uh, But that's not the case anymore. Things have really changed. Things have really moved on. Uh, You have a lot of young Tanzanians who are are well well exposed, some educated abroad, come back here and do a lot of of good stuff. Uh, So as much as you might underestimate, on the other hand, Tanzania, uh, if you are to compare to other markets, I think we are doing uh, way, way better in terms of the potential uh, of the country moving forward if we can fix all these few issues which I've mentioned earlier. Uh, speaking of underestimating things, yeah. in your career so far working here in the ecosystem, what's something that you've underestimated? Uh, I underestimated the idea that I thought if you, st- you set up an angel investors network, uh, it would be easy for people to join and start investing. <laughs> and it's, it's taken us more than three years uh, to, to build that. Like you said, you can't just build it and they will come. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, that's actually really, really interesting. Uh, I think being neighbors, it is really easy to constantly compare Tanzania to to Kenya. And Dar es Salaam and Nairobi, they're so close geographically. Mm -hmm. But you can't ignore really the differences that are really going on between the country when it comes to regulation, when it comes to just the culture, the mindset of... The talent. Actually, let's jump on that. What what is the talent like here? If we could take a, a step back and look at Okay, uh, the talent maybe compared to some other ecosystems in Africa, but also like what's good about it, what's what's missing, where are some of the gaps? Wow. So talent is one of my major issues here. If you ask me, if you are to list the top 10 challenges of doing business in, in Tanzania, number one for me will be talent, no, not even access to finance. 
So, and, and you can explain that in so many ways. One is, so the traditional formal education system in Tanzania has yet to, to produce competitive talents that we need in the market. That's one. Uh, so everyone who is graduating, majority uh, who are graduating from our education system coming to the market are pretty much half-baked, if I may, uh, not really ready to be taken up. That's one. But secondly, I think we don't have enough players in the ecosystem that can take up these, uh, all these graduates and upskill them to be ready for the ecosystem. Uh, we're still, I think, in a position where I see a few startups trying to build edu tech uh, startups that are trying to bridge that, that, that skills gap that we have here. So that's where I would, I would see it. But in terms of comparison, I think there was a study which was done a few years ago uh, about the number of developers that Africa has. And, and Tanzania, I think, was not even the top, top five, uh, was not there. So I think we still need to do a lot of work in terms of training uh, and getting more developers uh, that I think uh, you need if you want to build a tech ecosystem uh, as competitive as other markets. People have been complaining here about, say, all oh, these major brands going to Kenya, uh, with its Google, uh, with its Facebook, you know, setting up offices in Kenya. Uh, and one of the reasons is because they can easily uh, see the talent in Kenya that we probably don't have here. So we should not take that as an insult, but we should take it as a challenge that we need to work on. And another thing which I don't see pretty much happening here, which I think is now coming up slowly, is if you go to Kenya and Nigeria, for instance, you have a lot of diaspora community going back home with a lot of skills that they learned in, in more mature markets and trying to deploy those and, and starting companies in, in those markets, which we are yet to see pretty much happening here. Uh, so majority of startup founders that you see here probably went to school here, you know, graduated here. They didn't even have opportunity to work in the corporate world. So that's, that's what we see. Uh, so if the moment we start seeing Tanzanians who are working for Google, working for Facebook in the U.S., uh, working for Goldman Sachs, uh, come back here and, and start doing what we're doing, I think there will be a lot of uh, transfer of knowledge and skills that we need in terms of talent in the market. This is a trend, actually, in the conversations I've been having with individuals here. Even Chumani yesterday had mentioned this specific thing, the diaspora network. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely ringing true if more than one person is mentioning it. So talent, access to funding, maybe some regulation. What, what are some of the other challenges that maybe you see, like, top of mind? Yeah, so I think access to finance is the regulatory framework that we have in the market, the talent and skills. For me, and I think the fourth is the mindset. But to me, I think it's just one of the biggest. Yeah. Yeah. Just not in entrepreneurial culture, hustle culture. What do you think the barrier to that is? I think, first of all, we, I think one of the things that build entrepreneurial culture in many other markets is for people to see other successful entrepreneurs as role models and, and inspire them, which you don't see here. Uh, you know, those who have made it are not ready to come out and say, how do they, you know, get where they are today? You know, people don't write books about successful entrepreneurs, so you cannot really say, oh, I know him, that's where he started. He came from the same village, and this is where he is today. So that, to me, I think, tends to inspire and change the culture of people and seeing, okay, fine, maybe we can do this. Again, we don't have enough stories about entrepreneurs who have, who have tried, have failed, come back in, in, in starting again and build great stuff. So here, once you fail, people still look at it as a negative thing, uh, which to me, I think, is part of the culture. What opportunities here are you most excited about? Wow. Uh, everything. <laughs> so if you were to, to pick the top three to five, I think one is in agribusiness. Uh, you know, I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, we have all the potential to unlock that huge, you know, sleeping giant here. Uh, you know, Agri being the largest contributor to the GDP, almost one third of the GDP, being the largest employer, and at the same time, you know, given the, the largest contributor to our food security, I think is an opportunity for youth uh, to get opportunities. I think it's an opportunity for the country to tra transform itself if we can do some few fixes, including the, the application of technology. So that's one area which I think if we can combine the talent and the use of technology and build modern business models for agri, we can unlock that industry and it can create opportunities for so many people. But secondly, for me, I think is financial services for financial inclusion. Uh, leave aside all the hype about fintech in Africa. But I think 
because only 17% of all Tanzanians are formally banked uh, and less than 20% uh, insured. So for me, I think uh, is we only have one, hardly one million Tanzanians who are trading in the capital market. So for me, I think uh, we still need a lot of solutions that can bring a lot of Tanzanians into the financial ecosystem. Because if people are still outside the, the formal financial system, it's so hard to lift these people out of poverty. And thirdly, I think I'll pretty much go into healthcare. I think we still have a lot of broken healthcare infrastructure in this in this country, and healthcare is everything, uh, if if you may. So I think it's an opportunity for people to develop solutions. Uh, and lastly, I would I would definitely pick education. So, let's back up from the present day that we've been talking about the ecosystem as we see it today, and let's take out a crystal ball and look five years ahead. Uh, where do you see the ecosystem five years from now? I wouldn't want to compare Tanzania to another market, but if you were to compare Tanzania to its own, uh, where we are now in five years from now, if you look back, a few things I, I, um, I'm, I'm seeing. One is the more developed you know, startup building culture uh, here in the ecosystem as well, because today what we see is you have 70 plus uh, hubs here for startups, uh, but the production of investable startups is still very low. So what, what I, what the, the activity that I'm seeing now in the market will transform these hubs, become more effective as, as, a, as a startup builders, and we're probably going to see more and more strong startups coming to the market in the next five years. But secondly, I think to a large extent, the government will open up and have more friendly environment for startups, at least by, by a certain degree. Uh, because what we see now is the government is, is, is very open-minded to listen to what is happening. So we tell them, you know what, startups is a $3 trillion economy worldwide. So you cannot ignore this. So that's another thing that we, we, we try and see now. And, and finally, the government has accepted to, to differentiate startups from SMEs. So probably that will also help in terms of policy development in the future. And lastly, uh, we, still, we will still have uh, issues around access to finance, just like in many other markets but it won't be as we are today here. I think there'll be more initiatives in the market. Maybe one or two local funds will be there. Uh, maybe the culture about angel investing would have changed. Maybe the government will probably listen and support in terms of building uh, the funding ecosystem here, and probably more funding will be flowing to the market. And if uh, individuals want to get in touch with you, learn more about the ecosystem here, partnerships, yeah. what's the best way to reach you? So the best way is you can email me, it's a wolf. S A W A D H at S S C dot C O dot T Z. You can go to salumawad.com, you'll learn more about what I do at an individual level. And you can as well contact us through ssc.co.tz, which is our firm's web. Uh, and you'll learn more about what we do in terms of partnerships and synergies. Uh, but I'm very active on my social medias. So on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, same name Salumawad. It's so funny. VC Twitter is such a thing. It's such a thing. I don't yeah. know. I mean, <laughs> I'm on there too. Like I, I don't post that much, but uh, I follow. I mean, yeah, so I'm very active, actually. I'm very active. Great. I uh, I'll be sure to include all the links in the show notes as well. Well, Saloon, this has been really insightful for me. I appreciate you letting me come here in your office and take out a chunk of your time. Uh, I know my audience is going to get a lot out of this, so thank you for your personal time and thank you for what you're doing in the ecosystem. Yeah, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.